All right, it is 5.30, so welcome everybody to our very exciting Elon iMedia Capstone presentations. These projects are the result of a pretty much full year of work and learning on the part of our wonderful iMedia grad students. And when you see the big smiles on their faces, you'll know it's been a very intense year that they're very glad to be here at the finish line for. And I'm really looking forward to seeing their work tonight. Um, each student will have between eight and 10 minutes to present their capstone, after which if uh, some of you attendees have questions for them, you're welcome to type them in the Q&A box. And we'll have about five minutes of questions and answers for the attendees after the um, after they present, and then um, we'll go on to the next one. I'd also like to point out that there is a website for the uh, capstone event that has contact information for all of the students if you'd like further information after that. Our first presenter tonight is going to be Tears of Chase, and I'm just going to send her over to presenter mode and uh, let her go ahead and get started. All right, Tirza, it's all you. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Tirza Chase, and my capstone project is for friendly. So let's get started. Share the content. Okay, can everyone see it? Or yes. Okay. So. Forward Friendly. Forward Friendly is an educational interactive platform that allows the users to learn more about how to be fashion conscious. This platform will serve as a guide on how to be at your best, both fashion forward and performance friendly. As a consumer, we all play a part in how we interact with fashion for the environment's sake. So, why this topic? I love design, but I am in love with fashion. As you can see here, these pictures are designs that I've created for a brand that I work with called the Polar Movement. And this year I was just wondering more about just how we can do better for the environment, how we can allocate our materials better. So I thought, why not just not just inform myself, but inform the public, inform my, my audience. So I believe that it is a graphic designer's job to present the topics that are hard to understand in digestible, visually interesting format. Fashion sustainability can be complex, and I think that we all should be as knowledgeable as possible. So this interactive platform will cover materials properly used in fashion, labor laws, and the environmental effects from fashion. So um, Forward Friendly's logo is two Fs hugging each other with a hanger attached to it. The two Fs together represent compatibility or friendship that fashion and, and the environment can coexist in harmony together. Um, the fashion forward and environmentally friendly are playing into the name forward friendly and the font choice looks friendly and fun um, giving a sharp design on the f's for a cutting edge of fashion sense and information so the research and delivery the research for this project was extensive ranging from material science platforms to the unicef database for child labor this project this project overall has a quiz scrollable interaction animated infographics and data visualization to ease the amount of reading and allow the user to fully interact with the content. The goal is for the user to learn something new and adopt the knowledge into their everyday lifestyle. So artifacts created. During this experience, I created a style guide, site map, content inventory, animations, and a quiz for the entire website. So here you'll see the style guide um, is just the overall layout of how the website will be presented through colors, fonts, and imagery. The next artifact is the sitemap. And the sitemap is basically a directory for a website allowing you to plan out how you want the website to flow. So we have the splash page, as you'll see later. That's the introductory page to Forward Friendly. And then you have a quiz that you'll take. Um, it may be optional if you've already taken it, but it's highly recommended that you take it to engage with the content fully. Then you have a transitional page, which is the home page hosting the environmentally friendly materials, labor laws, energy use, friendly forward tips, and a retake quiz tab. Another artifact created was a content inventory. This was a four page document that just details everything that you'll see on the website from copy to photos to data. Um, anything that you could think of that you'll see on the website, it's all listed here. Um, another artifact was the interactive quiz. These were animated 
questions that give you a sense of what you're going to see for the rest of the website. It kind of sets up the style for the entire website too, because this is one of the first things that you'll actually get to engage with. So this is something fun that I created. And then lastly, we have motion graphics. So I don't know if you can see this animation, but there's an animation here and it's basically highlighting um, emissions, energy, and water use. There are three different videos that you can watch that will ease the user into the content without them having to read too much. So some challenges I encountered. The first thing was research. Trying to find information on specific materials, how they affect our environment um, was little to none almost, but it was scarce. So you would have to like search and cherry pick to get the information that you really wanted. And when it came to energy and emissions, it was kind of all scientific. So breaking it down to a more digestible format was a big challenge because I'm not science, but I do understand it enough to break it down. Um, another challenge is original photography. I planned on meeting up with Contour of Wrangler BF Jeans. Um, however, because of COVID-19, I wasn't able to be with them in person and be able to take pictures on how they are uh, utilizing their company for better fashion sustainability. So that was a little, you know, a little sad, a little depressing, but I made it through and I was able to use my research to the best of my ability. Um, one last challenge I'll mention is data. For my data visualization course I took using R and Tableau, I wanted to create um, a textiles versus child labor project, but I wasn't able to do that because as I mentioned before, research is very scarce, like little to none on fashion. So that made me realize that this project is even more important and just highlighting the importance of no child labor is being hosted and keeping this data open for the planet is just all more important. The more resources, the better. So I hope you enjoyed my presentation so far. I'm going to take you guys to my website. If you would like to follow along, go to www.forfriendly.com and let's begin. So here's the splash page. And so it's a nice little intro animation of the logo. And when you click on it, you'll go to a Saros quiz, which is where the quiz is hosted on the website. So you can either skip it if you've already taken it, but since we haven't taken it, I'll take you through it. So the first question will ask you, how do you prefer to shop? You can choose in-store or online, and these are animated graphics that will guide you throughout the quiz. Um, there's about six questions overall, and they give you an answer on why you chose you know, your answer, if it's right or wrong, and the source is all underneath of each answer that you get it from. So if you want to go directly to the source, you can. So I'm just going to zoom through this because I know we're on a time crunch. You know, here is just the quiz and you'll see different graphics as you go along, different ways to interact with the quiz. And it'll tell you like neither is a better choice or sometimes you'll get the answer right, sometimes you get the answer wrong. That's okay. That's what friendly Forward Friendly is here for. It's here to teach you and educate you in a fun way on how to wear your clothes and buy as a consumer better. So as you get to the sixth question, you'll see a submit button. And when you submit, it'll say assessment complete, just a little, you know, encouraging message saying like, you don't need to know all the answers. It's just, you know, it's just something to get you ready for the website. So here's the homepage and the homepage will tell you more about what Forward Friendly is. And there's navigation at the top, but there's also quick navigation here at the bottom. So the four tabs are materials used, labor laws, environmental effects, and forward friendly tips. So let's get into materials used. So the first thing you'll see here is the name of the material, the origin, composition, and forward friendliness. This is a page about material and how they're either good or bad for the environment. So as you'll see on the left, the material will change as you keep scrolling, and it'll give you more information about each product by origin, composition, and environmental friendliness, which is forward friendliness. So as you scroll through it, there's about seven of these materials. You can go eco backward and it will tell you materials that are unfriendly. So it'll take you back to the top and basically same deal on the left hand side, there is a material that changes and it'll tell you all about the composition. Um, the text is loading in for each one. So that's why it's you know going slow. But as you can see, you'll get more information about the materials that you're wearing. Okay, and then we go to labor laws and labor laws is about um, child labor and how there's over 170 million children still in child labor to this day. And so it talks about raw materials, inputs, production and final stage. 
And you can go down here and see a data visualization of a uh, map that shows everything that's going on. And from 1994 to 2016, and it'll show you a timetable basically of where you can go to find that information. The next thing that we have is environmental effects. And for the environmental effects, we have emissions, energy, and water use. And these are the animations provided that I was talking to you about. And so they basically show you all of the um, information about why fashion industry is kind of damaging to the environment and how we can do better. The last thing that I'll take you through is the four friendly tips. And this is a recap of the entire website and everything that you should learn. And so um, some takeaways from four friendly you'll see and it's um, some scrollable animations going on, like check inside the tag, look up the emissions rate, change the way you support online fast fashion, who is creating the clothes and think for yourself. And then the last thing you'll see is stay fashion forward and think environmentally friendly. That's our mission statement, vision statement. And when you go to um, this page, you'll learn more about just how to use all this information to your advantage. So thank you. That's my project. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, I don't have any questions that are in the box right now, but does anybody have any questions I'd like to ask Tirza? I apologize for coming late. I had an issue logging in, but Tirza, that was a great project. And perhaps you said it, um, but where do you see this information being like most helpful? Like, where could you see, like, would this be like something you want to implement, like in the school system? Like, who could best benefit from your website? I think definitely school system, like an environmental science course would definitely get the most out of this or in college learning about fashion, textiles and the industry garments that they use. They talk probably a lot about material science. So the audience would be catered towards those type of people, people who are interested in the environment, people who are interested in fashion and those who just want to do better. other questions you can drop your question below in the chat box it's open okay well thanks a lot and um there is uh, an opportunity to contact you through your email on your portfolio site which is linked from the whole capstone presentation so i'm going to go ahead and uh pass the control on to anna who will be up next and a second to do that. Yeah. And you're set. Okay. Hey everyone, um, my name is Anna Sizemore and let me just share my screen very quickly. Um, are you able to see my PowerPoint? Are you guys, okay. <laughs> All right. Um, so again, my name is Anna Sizemore <clears throat> and my project is called the Winter Circle Learning with VR. And um, just to get started, I wanna give kind of a basic description. Um, the, the Winter Circle is a virtual reality game built to learn and practice identifying stars and constellations. Um, it's intended for astronomy students and professors as a supplemental tool to learn the Winter Circle specifically. Um, and it was developed using Unity Game Engine. And this is a link to where you can find it. And I will go into further detail about the link at the end. Um, so there are a few reasons that I chose to do this project. First of all, um, VR is a brand, not a brand new technology, but it is still a very new technology um, with much potential in the field of education. And that really hasn't been thoroughly explored. Um, so I kind of wanted to take the opportunity to do that with this project. Uh, also, I have a VR headset at home, so I am very familiar with the technology. And I thought it would be a fun challenge to take on building for VR um, for my capstone project. And then finally, it's difficult to practice stargazing due to the various conditions that can prevent the night sky from being clear enough to actually see stars or constellations. Um, as you can imagine, practicing in real life is very important for astronomy students or anybody that's trying to get better at stargazing. Um, so I'm going to go into a few details about my process. Um, first of all, I developed all the scenes for the game in the Unity game engine. I used the language C Sharp and Visual, so Visual Studio Code Editor to code the interactions between the users and the game objects. Um, some of these interactions include things like clicking the star, the next button, things of that nature. 
And then I used Illustrator to design tablet screens that give information about the game levels. And this is information such as uh, what level you're on, what you have to do to get to the next level and things like that. Um, so the first step in my process was to identify who my audience was. And I did that by building this persona. Um, I knew from the get go that I wanted it to make it for astronomy students, but I wanted to be able to identify the frustrations that astronomy students um, currently felt trying to learn about constellations and stars with like the technology that we have now, such as like iPhone apps. Um, and one of the biggest frustrations that I kept seeing was that it's not as good as it is to pull it up on your phone and be able to see the constellation and be able to read about it. It's very difficult to transfer that into real life. So my main goal for this project was to create a game in virtual reality that was easily transferable, transferable into like a real life environment. If I can stand in this virtual environment and identify these stars, then I should be able to do it in real life as well, which is when for astronomy students, when they would be getting the grade. So my next step was to start illustrating um, what some of the levels would look like. I knew also from the, begin the beginning that I wanted my user to have an, uh, some sort of tablet um, to guide them through because as much as, even though it was a game, I didn't want it just to have a game screen that just had information on it. I wanted it to be as realistic as possible. Um, and the most realistic way that a student would get that information, such as what star am I supposed to identify next? Where would I find it? would be on a tablet or a notebook of sorts. So I decided to go with my tablet idea um, and I do did the separate levels. Um, each level is a little different. You know, it gets harder as you go along and then certain levels have a diagram like shown here and certain levels don't have a diagram, um, which is the harder level. And of course the easier level comes before the harder level. So like the first level one will show you where the star Rigel's at then level three, you have to find Rigel based off of your memory. And then I started to build my 3D environment with Unity. Um, so my first steps were to build the objects that would be on the person's hands, which was the tablet and the laser pointer. Um, on the left side of the screen, you can see the tablet. And I kind of talked a little bit about this already, um, but it is attached to the hand. Um, it's not, you can't put it down. So the user never loses it or things like that. Um, it's always there for you to refer back to, to understand where you are at in the level, um, what constellation you're working on and what to do to get to the next level. And then on the right side of the screen, you can see the laser pointer, which uses a raycaster method to help users uh, click the stars. Um, and it's really that what's code, that's what's coded to get those react, those interactions with the users. Um, I also did build some user interface screens to kind of keep it game-like um, with the level complete, the start screen, things like that. I didn't want them to be super distracting, so I made them as simple as possible. And finally, I built my total terrain or environment that the user is in, um, which is at the top of the screen. And you can see that it kind of looks like a mountain overlook, and I did that to give a realistic view um, where somewhere that you would go that you would see a wide open space where you could just look out at the stars and it would be dark enough to see the stars. Um, so I faced a few challenges with this project. Uh, one of the biggest ones that I had was learning C Sharp and its use in Unity in such a brief period of time. Um, C Sharp is a very different coding language than I've ever had experience with before, and I had no prior experience with Unity. So trying to use them in combination within just such a short period of time was very difficult. Luckily, I had a great support system of professors that were familiar with uh, Unity in this program. Um, I also had some difficulty storyboarding a 3D environment. Um, if you can imagine, I had a idea of what I wanted this 3D environment to look like, but I had a very hard time putting that on a 2D piece of paper and being able to convey that to someone else and get proper feedback. Um, COVID-19 brought its own challenges. Um, for one, working at home was not something I expected. So having to develop 3D environments at home was very difficult uh, as these 3D softwares are very taxing on your computer's processing power. And then when you throw a VR headset into that mix, it just, it creates a lot of technical difficulties that I had to work through in a timely manner. And also the inability to perform usability, usability tests due to social distancing. Um, so now I'm gonna take you to the website where the project is housed. Um, I built this website using jo or JavaScript, HTML, CSS, and Bootstrap. It just has a link to download the file. Um, it has some information about what the winter circle is, 
in terms of what it is in astronomy as well as what it is as a game. And then I created this uh, this gameplay of the demo. That way, if someone doesn't have the right computer or a VR headset, they can still see what it would look like to play this game. Um, so I'm going to play part of this video now, and um, I'm not going to play the whole thing. I'm going to be skipping through it because it's unnecessary to watch the whole thing, as you just heard me talk about part of that, that information. So I'm going to start that. All right, so this is the demo to help in the winter circle and how to identify. So I'm going to take a minute just to look around the terrain. Um, the terrain was built to look like a mountaintop with an overlook um, to stargaze at with like an unobstructed view. Um, the winter circle is in this area. So this is a good um, direction to be looking and it kind of gives a realistic feeling um, for, the, for the player. All right, so here's the start menu. It's just placed into this uh, terrain. Um, this is the same terrain that is used throughout the entire game. Um, the start menu has both an option to see how to play, um, which you can read through and learn how to play and learn the controls, and as well as the start button, and we will go ahead and get started. All right, um, so we're on level one. As you can see, the user's equipped with an, a tablet and a laser pointer. Um, the tablet will identify the name of the constellation and the level and the task for that constell or for that level, as well as uh, directions to return to the main menu if needed. Um, so for the first level, we'll be identifying um, Rigel, which is one of the brightest stars in Orion. Um, Orion is the only constellation throughout this level for, throughout this demo, um, so just keep that in mind. So for level one, you can see that there is a chart. Um, that kind of gives the user an idea of what Orion is going to look like, and they can refer to that chart to see the star. So if I were to choose the wrong star, you can see there's uh, feedback that gives the user the idea that they don't have the right answer and to keep trying. So let's identify Rigel. All right. I'm just going to move to the last level. Um, so that you can see maybe what one of the end levels would look like. And then the final level, we have to identify the whole constellation without the guide. As we did earlier, except earlier we had a guide to follow. All right, and that is the end. Um, so this will take you back to the main menu. And we'll go, of course, back to the main menu. And um, in later versions of this, there will be an option to choose constellations um, and to start on the new levels of constellations, new level of constellations. All right, um, so that was my project. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to ask them um, or check out the website or contact me or ask now. So. so we did have one attendee question which was um, what kind of OS you need, and in particular if you need an Android phone in order to use it. Um, so it's actually through a Unity, um, there, so it's not built for a mobile phone. Um, right now it's housed on Unity, it's not on the Oculus Store or Steam or anything, but it was mostly designed for the Oculus Rift and Rift S. Um, maybe in the future, once we get past the demo, we could see about porting it to other features as well. Um, the Android does use uh, the Oculus does use Android Studios to um, develop, but it's not quite optimized for the Oculus Go, which is the mobile phone. And then we got a second question. It says, as a non-scientist, I'm really interested in science and space, so I appreciate this project and how accessible it is. Thank you. What were your first steps transitioning 3D ideas to paper? It was extremely difficult. Um, and also, you know, working with my capstone professor at the time, um, she's wonderful, but my goal, it was, it was just so difficult to do. Um, basically, I had a regular storyboard paper with, you know, the um, a three by three set of boxes, and I set the middle box to saying, this is what it would look like if you're looking straight forward. If you looked up, it would look like what the top boxes looked like. And if you looked below, it would look like what the bottom three boxes looked like. So I still use the same storyboard format. It's instead my whole scene took up the whole paper, if that makes sense. I 
thank you. Um, <laughs> I just had one comment that I think relates to uh, your project and Tears' project, which is, um, I know both of you had challenges due to um, being you know, in the middle of a pandemic and all of those kinds of things. But I think it's also a kind of an interesting opportunity for both of you. Um, I know that um, science classes are trying to figure out how they're gonna do labs at home. And I think projects like uh, Anna's will be useful for that. And uh, Tirza, we actually have a uh, course at Elon. It's one of the uh, sort of capstone classes for the core curriculum that is on like relating the environment and fashion. Um, and I think cool. it can be really relatable for that as well. Okay. Uh, does anybody else have questions for Anna? Okay, great. I'm going to go ahead and pass control on over to Liza Bunston. Hi, everyone. Soon as I get that, I will bring up my presentation. Um, okay, here we go. And we see it, Liza. Perfect. All right, so hi everyone. My name is Liza Bunce, and for my capstone project, I created a website called Georgie Explains Climate Change. So Georgie Explains Climate Change is a website designed to teach third to fifth graders the very basics of climate change. And I wanted to focus on those basics, but also on how climate change relates to the ocean um, in particular. So as I just said, my target audience was third to fifth graders as their uh, literacy levels tend to be more where you're, you can talk more easily about uh, scientific topics such as climate change, which can have a bit different terminology than just regular topics. Their teachers were also one of my target audiences as their teachers are hopefully the ones that will use the website and introduce it to their students. Um, I have a website, which means they use HTML and JavaScript to create it. And then I have a storybook and a couple quizzes in there, which I used Seros to create, which is a uh, interactive storybook website creator. Um, and then I used Adobe Illustrator for my graphic design as well. Some of the challenges I faced, um, one of the big one was one of the big ones was scientific terminology. Climate change in general has a lot of big words in it that might be difficult for elementary age children. One of the main ones is ocean acidification. That was one I really had to think about because it doesn't have a simpler term to talk about it. So what I ended up doing was breaking it down, explaining what it is and using simpler terms to explain that. And then introducing the word at the end saying, you know, this is a big word, but you already understand what it is because of what you've just gone through and read. Fossil fuels, luckily they are two smaller words that I could make do with. Um, so I didn't have to worry about that one as much, just explaining what they are, what they do, why they're a big deal. Um, continuing on my challenges, creating, I created two different teacher worksheets for my website. That way teachers could print them off and assign them to students um, for homework or in-class activities. And so I had initially planned to work with different teachers to complete this. However, when um, we started working from home and all schools went online, those teachers' schedules suddenly got very busy, completely understandably, um, and they didn't no longer had the time to help me because they were trying to get everything in order for their own classroom. Um, so that's one of the ways that the virus has affected this and kind of made this more challenging. Um, another way it has that I've worked around is I've had to really up my time management skills because I had a lot to do in the past couple months when we were working at home now and didn't have all the same resources we would have had if we had been in school. Um, at Elon. So, all right, my process. Um, so I actually chose this topic because my undergrad degree is in zoology. I have a passion for science. That's actually me in the middle in this photograph, uh, dissecting a fish. Um, but I really have a passion for science education and public education, especially explaining hard topics to people in very simple ways that I hope they can understand. Um, I, I decided to hand code this website instead of making it a WordPress website because I can more easily implement the design that I wanted and I knew how to code it to get what I wanted it to do. Um, I also decided to use a storybook because who doesn't love a story? And children in particular really love having characters they can relate to. So if they have characters they can relate to, they can understand the topic um, better, which is what I was hoping for. So I process 
by creating a couple different storyboards um, and writing down notes on what I thought it would be like and what I would want to do. The left and right picture show um, two different storyboards when I was in the process of designing what I thought it would be like. Initially, I thought about having a hermit crab start off the story, but as I went along in the process, that got nixed. Um, and the middle picture is when I decided on which body of water, which ocean, would have what animal and what they would be talking about. From there, I decided to create my ocean. I need to cre uh, create my animals and my different oceans. And so on the left, you can see an example of the creation of Alex, the elephant seal. I found a bunch of different inspiration for him and kind of put it all together to make the animal that I needed. And on the right, you can see the Pacific Ocean, where I found pictures of the Pacific Ocean and pictures of coral reefs um, and kind of put it together to create that middle picture you see um, right here, which has Ellie the reef shark in it, a uh, black tip reef shark in it as well. So put it all together and was able to create Georgie's Journey, which is my storybook. Um, these are four different screen captures from it. This first one is our title screen. The second one is where you can go to change to the different oceans to read their different stories. This was Ellie the reef shark, who you just saw before, um, just a screen grab from hers. And this is um, at the Arctic Ocean. This is Luna the ringed seal, one a screen grab from hers as well. So moving on to my website, um, I started off with a content inventory in class, trying to figure out what kind of information I wanted to convey about climate change. And to do that, I need to know what my audience, who my audience was. And so I created two personas, one for an elementary age student and another for a teacher of elementary school students and figured out what they would need, what they would want. And I created a wireframe from that. One thing I didn't think about initially with my wireframe was I was still creating it for an older audience without realizing it. As I went along, I realized that I couldn't it simpler and more fun for children. So the left here is one of my first mock-ups. At that point, I was still having it a little bit too um, adulty, I guess is going to be the word I'm going to use um, for children. And so the right side is my second mock-up that I made where I changed up the colors. I created a navigation bar here where it's larger buttons where kids can click more easily and see where they want to go. And I tried to add um, more fun with the logo and a rope right here. But as you'll see in just a second, that is not how it ended up working. So this is my final website. This is what you're gonna see if you go to georgieexplains.com. This is what the first page, which is what is a climate. I decided to do five different pages. The first, what is a climate, is right here. I have some graphics that I made, which is not my strongest suit. So this was difficult for me, but I believe it turned out very well. Um, and these just help explain to children what's the difference between a biome climate and a city climate, just so they get a better understanding, along with a graph of just some average global temperatures. From there, we went to what's the big deal, where I break down why it's such a big deal that our climate is changing right now, because it's changed before, usually over thousands to millions of years, but it's changing right now in only about a 200 year period, which is not great, which is what I explain in here, created a couple more graphics as well, implemented them, explained in more simple terms what's happening, what it means for the earth, and then I the oceans. So the ocean has five bodies of water, which is what I wanted children to be aware of. Um, I also put my Sarah storybook in here where you can click it and go through it and kind of see what the deal is. You're introduced to Georgie, who is right here. She is our lobster. Um, and it just talks about what's going on with the ocean, how climate change, change is affecting it, and what uh, individuals can do to help. From there, I created two little games for students to be able to test their knowledge and kind of have fun. Um, the second one just sees which animal from Georgie's Journey you're most like. And then after that, I decided to create some teacher resources, which are just a crossword puzzle and uh, an unscrambling. Um, once they load, there's a crossword puzzle, just a couple simple words. And then the bodies of water, you unscramble the body of water, and then you label it. And to top everything off, I did make sure I had my sources on here, which I'll have links so you can go and learn more about it if you would like to. Um, but overall, I just really wanted to be able to create a website where kids can have the knowledge to talk about climate change, 
have their curiosity picked and ask any questions they want to. So without any further ado, are there any questions for me? Okay, so first we have a comment that says, I like the color choices for the web page. It makes it look like something kids would be drawn to. Good job. And then there's a couple of questions as well. So the first question is, why did you call the lobster Georgie? So the name Georgie actually is just the name I really like. Um, I felt that it fit her and it was kind of a older type of name. Here, I'll screen so y'all can see me. Um, I thought it was an older kind of name because Georgie is actually 87. Um, they believe lobsters might actually be immortal because right now they only know that they die from like humans or predators. So I figured I'd make her old, give her one of those older sounding names and Georgie it was. <laughs> okay, and uh, the second question was, um... Uh, this right now lives as a website. Do you think it could work as like a kiosk, like at the zoo? I've never considered that. I think with some tweaking, it there's a possibility it could. Yeah, I think um, the storybook especially could be implemented on a kiosk because kids can just click it and walk through it and meet the characters. And if it's at a zoo, they have those characters. You could adjust that so they can then go see the storybook as well. Great idea. <laughs> yeah, just uh, throwing in something I've seen. So um, at the North Carolina Zoo, there is an interactive game in the polar bear exhibit that was an iMedia project. Oh, that's cool. Beyond, yeah, so we might have some connections there for you. Georgia. Okay. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And so we got another comment that says, as the father of a third grade daughter, she would absolutely love this. She really enjoys storybooks and learns better through stories. Great job, Liza, go Elon. <laughs> it's from one of our ones. All right. Uh, any other questions for Liza? Okay, we'll move on. And Victoria, I'm going to pass the uh, control to you. I can't wait to see your project. Okay, hello everyone. One second, just trying to share my screen. Okay, can you guys see my screen? Yes. All right, hello everyone. My name is Victoria Morrell, and for my um, graduate capstone project, I chose to create an interactive website called the Black Hair Museum. So, sorry. So the. The Black Hair Museum was created to showcase the history of black hair and just highlight its true beauty. I created the Black Hair Museum in Ceros, which is a cloud-based design platform that uses um, digital canvases to animate content, bring the content to life. And if you're maybe not a developer or not the best designer, it really helps you um, walk through that whole process. And you can access my project at the link below. So the primary audience members for the Black Hair Museum will be women who want to, black women who want to know more about their black hair and how to maintain it. Um, secondary audience members will be pe people of non-color um, or perhaps foster parents who have children who are black and they don't know how to do their hair simply because black hair, I described it as a snowflake. I mean, it's different. We all have, I'll break it down when I get to my website, but um, it's just different in its own right. And the tertiary audience members would be people who make up laws about black hair. Um, I feel like this was a timely project simply because there are laws being made about black hair and it's just kind of blows my mind simply because it's what grows out of your hair and there are laws being made against it or about what you can and cannot do with your own hair. So the process of the Black Hair Museum was inspired by my own experience. Um, just trauma as a child, I've always, you know, love my hair, but at times it was hard to do that. And I feel like if I was able to create something that can inspire someone else to love their hair, then I feel like, you know, my mission was accomplished here. Um, I chose Saros to create this project in because it was easy to navigate. It was hard at first simply because I had never been introduced to Saros, but once I um, was able to navigate it, they have video lessons and also the Help Center is what helped me create the Black Hair Museum. The sprint model is essentially the Semester was broken up into different week sections and it was it helped me keep it helped keep me on track. 
Um, I created the Adobe, sorry, oh, well, I'm God, sorry, I'm so nervous. I created my Black Hair Museum logo in Adobe Illustrator, and then I imported that into Cirrus. And I thought it was important to include, you know, my mock-ups and what brought me to the Black Hair Museum simply because it came a long way. I wanted this project to initially be video heavy simply because I have a background in video, but, you know, due to coronavirus, a lot of people kind of canceled on me or like um, Liza was saying, people, their schedules essentially just became busy and I wasn't able to get the videos that I wanted. So I had to improvise and bring new concepts into the website. And to the right is an emotion map that I created when I first knew that I wanted to create the Black Hair Museum, where it's such as self-esteem and love, frustrated, passionate, disgust, jealousy. You know, these are just words that I, that came to my mind when I thought about Black hair. And over here, this was, to the right is what the initial mock-up of the website looked like. And here is a comb that I created in um, Adobe Illustrator. I'm so sorry, about why about this? So to the left is a comb that I created in Adobe Illustrator. Um, I thought creating products that promoted black hair would be the best to showcase on my website. And this is the Black Hair Museum logo that you do see here. The um, light bulb is what I use on my process page while I was brainstorming to create the Black Hair Museum. So the challenges that I had, like the biggest one was working from home through the coronavirus. It was hard to complete this project and not have the resources that I would have on campus. And also just working on my laptop, sometimes I would need the two screens set up or maybe more than one computer. So working through coronavirus was one of my greatest challenges. Not being around my classmates, sometimes having the reassurance, you know, that I wasn't going through this process alone was, you know, hard for me. Um, finding new content to put on the website because, like I said, I did want this to be very video heavy and I had to find new content to put in there. So that was also a challenge. And then learning to navigate a new software, but in the end, it was worth it because I could definitely see myself, you know, using Ceros after I leave my medium. And here are some screen grabs of my project. At the very top, these doors right here on my website, which I'll take you to next, they animate in. To the right is a hair texture chart because like I said, black hair is like snowflakes. Every black woman may not, you know, they may be mixed and their texture is different and it requires different care, different products. And on the website, it shows you different styles and how to maintain your black hair. Now we can go to the side. You can see those animate in. And here is just a quick description of you know what the Black Hair Museum is. And my slogan is Black Hair is Bold, Beautiful, and Timeless. Here, timeless, excuse me, here is a navigation bar that'll take you through the entire website. And here is the Black Hair Museum logo. And I'm not sure if this video will translate well, but I'll play this. These are what some black women said about their black hair. My hair means everything to me. It makes me feel sexy. Can you stop for a second? Oh. It defines. Yeah. Your stuff's not showing to the screen yet. We may need to wait a second for it to show up. Okay. That happened before when we were practicing. There was a little bit of a delay, but we can uh, we can be patient. Got you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Can you see my website now? Not uh, yet. Hold on. There. Nope, that's your PowerPoint. Okay, so if I go to my point, well, instead of going from there, I have it pulled up in the browser. Can you see this? You need to reshare your screen. It's on just the PowerPoint right now. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay. I'm trying to make it bigger, I feel like. I'm so confused, man. I'm sorry. I 
So I'm stopped sharing. Now I'm sharing it again. To share Google Chrome. There you are. Yay. Okay, good, good. Sorry about that. Thanks everyone for waiting. Okay. And let me refresh this. Okay, so can everyone see what I'm doing? Okay. So the Black Hair Museum, that was the initial logo that those, those doors populate in. Here's a description of the site. And my slogan is the Black Hair is beautiful, bold, and timeless. Here's a quick navigation bar that allows you to go to each page. And here is a video of just some Black women saying what their Black hair means to them. My hair means everything to me. It makes me feel sexy, beautiful, elegant. It defies gravity. It is a part of who I am. I love my hair. To me, Black hair means creativity and freedom of expression. Okay, and then if we go to the hair page. Here's the hair texture chart. Um, black hair is um, categorized usually into kinky, coily, curly, wavy um, to straight hair. And I thought it would be a good idea just so black girls or just even people you know who don't have black hair can identify, they can see someone I'm like, okay, well, I'm not sure what my hair texture is, but it does look you know similar to this girl here with this curl pattern. And this just showcases you know different type of protective styles. We have wigs, natural hairstyles, and also relaxed hair. I feel like a myth about black hair is that if you have relaxed hair, then your hair isn't healthy. You can have healthy relaxed hair. It's just not natural. And also this was a place where you can um, identify what your hair color is. And here on the history page, it goes to some popular hairstyles from the early 2000s. So each year I showed a popular hairstyle from just some celebrities and just black hair trends. And also this was supposed to be 100 years of hair just showcasing a popular hairstyle from each decade. And then just some fun facts about black hair. The first one was African slaves used to braid es um, escape routes into their hair to communicate um, ways to freedom. So just, you know, if you do want to explore the website a little more, you can learn more about that. Products and care page, I feel like was extremely important simply because the keys to having healthy black hair are the products that you use to keep up with it. So these are just some, um, some tips at the bottom on what you should do and you know, things that are important when it comes to black hair. And then again, here's my process page just showing how the Black Hair Museum came about. And then I have an about me page. One second. Can you guys see my PowerPoint? Okay. All right. And then I just want to give a special thanks to Dr. Mona, who, you know, helped me, you know, who was a great advisor, Dr. Avatar, who helped me identify other target audience areas, Dr. Sawande Mustakim. She came and spoke to um, a group of students at Elon, and she also helped me. Um, do some research on how I should bring this to life. My classmates that were, you know, in the same capstone as me, because like I said, we weren't going through this alone. And thank you, God, for bringing me this far. So oh, that's the Black Hair Museum. All right. Um, we got a couple of comments and questions. 30 years later. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, the first comment is uh, love the history page. Um, that like adds a real nice level of depth, I think, to the whole site, which is really cool. Um, I know that you couldn't make as many videos as you wanted to for this. How would more video have made a difference in the site? So the purpose of the videos will be more like how to videos. I'm just simply showing you how you can achieve some of these styles, because I feel like the type of learner I am, I could read something, but I feel like I would be able to you know, maybe 
do a hairstyle if I was able to actually see it. And then I had some interviews with some Elon staff members and it was just kind of how the homepage saying what their hair means to them and perhaps some of their experiences with their hair. And that was the purpose of the videos for the website. Okay. And then, um, so you've got a kind of combination of audiences, um, people who were wanting to um, know more about hair, maybe that they have or that they take care of for someone else and then lawmakers. So how were you able to sort of, or what kind of things did you do to sort of make a site that would be interesting to both kinds of audiences? So what I did was essentially, I had to put, well, I wanted to put myself in someone else's shoes because like, if I don't know anything about black hair, I wanted to make it easy for people to navigate, easy for people to understand and also something fun and interactive. So I think maybe looking at, you know, from the outside looking in was the biggest thing that helped me create the Black Hair Museum. Like I want, oh, it's another thing. I wanted to like highlight the beauty of black hair because it's just so dynamic and it comes in so many different forms. And it's something that I'm passionate about. And even, you know, right now I am wearing extensions, but my real hair, I'm on a, I'm on a natural hair journey. I cut all of my hair off and it just makes me feel empowered. And also I just wanted other people to understand how I feel. So that is why I created the Black Hair Museum. Awesome. Thanks. Uh, Comment that says, I love it, Victoria. Good job. Thanks. Yeah. All right. Any other questions for Victoria? Great. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and pass control over to Will. Sorry. I'm super good at this. All right, well, you should get it in a second. All right, I got it. Can you all see my screen? Right, so, um, hello, everybody. My name is Will Brown. I am a member of the Elon University Interactive Media Class of 2020. And my project is called Behind the Bent. And Behind the Bent, is an interactive website that serves to help student athletes find the resources they need as well as educate prospective college athletes and younger sports fans on what it was like on what it's like to be a college athlete in a fun and engaging manner my, my primary audience for this project is current college athletes my secondary audience is prospective college students i'm a ter my ter 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 territory audience i hope i pronounced that right um is younger athletes who maybe have grown up watching college sports, maybe want to play someday, and are hoping to learn more about it. Um, my inspiration for this site was that I knew I wanted to do something sports related. Anybody that's worked with me all year probably knows that I'm a very passionate sports fan. And when I was an undergrad, I had a background as a sports journalist, so I really wanted to incorporate that into my site somehow. And some of the websites that inspired me were some of my favorite sports content sites, such as The Ringer and The Athletic. And I really wanted to make my site resemble those. So the technology I used to make this site was Adobe Illustrator, Adobe XD, Adobe After Effects, Saros, and WordPress. So, um, so I'm going to go ahead and go to the site now. Um, so the way this project sort of took place, it all started this picture right here, can everyone see this? All right, so this was how it all started. This was, we made this probably before I even turned in my project proposal about um, just what the site was going to be and um, what we originally intended for it to look like. So um, we used the um, spread model to make this project and that was really helpful because what it does is it takes a very huge project and breaks it down into manageable two week chunks. And every two weeks, you get to set goals for yourself. That are um, reasonable and attainable to do in a two week period. And you really sort of um, line up what your goals are going to be before the project even starts. So, um, I started off with sprint zero, which is a pre production sprint. And what I did during that sprint was schedule interviews with people. Um, mainly at Elon, this was originally supposed to be a project that was mainly going to focus on Elon athletes. 
So I um, scheduled interviews with um, people in um, Elon's athletic faculty in the exercise science department and in the um, athletic career services department. So I wrote interview scripts during this um, sprint as well, and I also practiced my video editing skills because this was originally supposed to be a video editing project. And I'll explain later on why that did not end up being the case. Um, so during the first sprint, I conducted my first few interviews and I made a wireframe of the site in Adobe XD that looked like this. This was what I originally intended it to look like. And it changed a great deal throughout the project. And um, so, so far in the project, everything was going pretty smoothly. But then right around spring break, this happened. And the coronavirus pandemic shut down Elon for the semester, and I had to finish this project from home. And for me, home is 700 miles away from Elon. So this was going to be a major roadblock for me to finish. So the very first thing I did after I, after the campus shut down and I had to start working from home was I decided I was going to have to make this project a little less Elon-centric. Up to this point, I had only done interviews with Elon people. But um, once I got home, I contacted um, some people I knew from my undergrad that had played athlete, that had played a sport while they were there, and that was a really helpful perspective because um, I went to a D three school for undergrad, and um, there's a very different experience between being a D three athlete and being a D one athlete. The recruitment process is a lot different, and so is the actual college experience, and so I'm really glad I got that perspective. And the other thing I did during the sprint was I made a motion graphic, which is on my activities page. Um, I guess a little 15 second welcome to the site video that I'll play for you guys real fast. Taking a second to load. So I made that, but that ended up being the only video I had for this project. Um, so during sprint three, I really started putting my site together. Um, I created this domain in WordPress and I started writing stories for this site based on the content I'd gotten in my interviews. I wrote three stories for this site, one about a mental health in student athletes, how to, affect, how to effectively balance schoolwork with academic responsibilities. Um, I wrote a story about um, life after college, how student athletes can prepare for their postgraduate professional career. And I wrote a story about the recruitment process and thus on choosing your best fit. Um, so I started writing these in um, sprint three. But sprint three ended up being the most challenging sprint for me because it was a sprint where I really began to realize how um, the limitations I had not working for Elon and how this project was going to have to change the video. So um, I realized pretty quickly that I did not, my computer was not big enough to handle some of the large video files I was dealing with and that I was not able to get to Elon and access the lab computers because of coronavirus. Um, so, and there were more than a few issues I ran into with video. So during the sprint, I had to make the difficult decision to cut the video part out of my project and replace it with something else. And what I ended up doing instead of the video was I used Serif to um, make interactive stories and really sort of add um, a level of interactivity to my site. And this one, this sort of also began to appeal more to my secondary and territory audiences um, because it was really designed toward them younger viewers. So I'll show you a couple of those things I made real fast. Um, I made, the first thing I did was I made an interactive infographic in Saros about um, the professional careers of athletes in different sports, how long they play, and a fun fact about each sport. You can click on it and see, um, see some of that information. And then um, the other thing I did was based on the information that I'd gotten from the people I interviewed. And they had a Sarah called the college athlete, which sort of takes um, 
a prospective student or a younger viewer through the day-to-day -day life of a college athlete during the season with their own, what their daily routine is like, what they eat for breakfast, and so on, what their class schedule can be like, then what a game day is like, um, how the games are usually scheduled and what happens after the game, and then there's an option to go to a non-game day as well, see what a practice session is like, and then finally see um, what the evenings are like, um, what study habits, um, important study habits to have if you're a college athlete. So finally, Sprint 5 was really just an editing sprint. I had a lot of edits to do after um, after I got um, sort of my whole project in place. And um, I also made this activities page, which I'll show you, which had some games on it. I found a couple great plugins I used, one called HP5 and one called QuizCat. With them, I made a sports quiz, I made a word search, and then down here at the bottom of the page, I made a timeline about them, the history of college sports, because I was a history major when I was undergrad, and I had a background in sports history as well, so I really wanted to find a way to incorporate that into my project. And um, so I'll show you some more about the site now. I made them. Um, so when you go to the site, this is what the home page looks like. It just has um, a brief description about the site. So you can go to the stories page and find um, the story. The story is um, about maybe, they're not too long. Um, they have direct quotes from in-person interviews, some graphics I made. I created all these graphics myself. Um, the photos here, since um, one another roadblock I ran into was not being able to um, take photos on the Elon campus, which was something I originally planned to do. So these are all stock photos that I found from a site called Unsplash. This was really helpful. And here's another one of my stories. I made this resource page as well, which basically um, has really relevant information to current college athletes, um, some sites they can go to to sort of, um, and college students in general as well. Um, some updated information about NCAA rules, such as name, image, and likeness, um, scholarships, um, transfers, waivers, academic support, stuff like that. And so finally, I would like to thank my classmates, um, my professors for giving me constant feedback along the way. I really hope that I gave you guys good feedback as well. And at this point, um, here's some of my contact information if anyone would like to get in touch with me. And at this point, I'll open it up to questions. So um, we got a couple of generally appreciative comments. And so I have a question for you, which is that I know that you um, did some mass communication work and like the sports journalism and stuff before you came here. In what ways was the storytelling for this like the same or different from what you had done in the past? Um, for the stories themselves, it was pretty similar to what I had done when I worked for a newspaper where um, I got quotes and I um, pulled those quotes together to tell a story. Um, what made this different though was I was really um, designing this more for multimedia because originally I was planning on um, videotaping all the interviews that I did and showing off those, but um, I ran into a variety of roadblocks. And then also, um, another thing that I learned that I thought was very helpful was taking the um, information I'd gotten from my interview subjects and telling that story in a different way rather than just typing out what they said. Um, so that's kind of how I put together the A Day in the Life of an Athlete story. And um, so just, um, just being able to sort of tell those stories in different ways rather than just traditional journalism. How do you think the uh, sprint model that you used plays into the storytelling? Because it's not usually the way we would like work through a story, right? Usually we do the whole thing and then we'd like get feedback and then modify. Um, so I think the sprint model was really helpful for a lot of ways. I think it really helped me structure this project and um, especially after we had to move online for the semester. In terms of the stories, I tried to get the content early and then um, put them together. I wanted to put that together first before I started putting the content around it together. 
Um, so I think that that sort of just helped me really sort of organize what was going to be posted and when, and then sort of how the other stuff in my site, the more interactive stuff, was going to sort of tie into my stories. Yeah, and someone wanted to know, for the videos that you did get to do some work on, what were they about? Do you think you might be able to use them later? Um, so one of them was with Eric Hall, who's an exercise science professor at Elon. And that was just about mental health in student athletes and the most common issues they run into when balancing um, athletics and academics. And the other was with um, Paul Vastovitz, who's in athletic career services. He was a great guy to talk to. Um, he just gave a lot of information about um, athletically transferable skills and how um, athletes can approach um, their goals of maybe playing professionally. And if they're not going to do that, um, how the transition from going from athletics to a non-athletic position. Um, so I think um, a lot of the content I got, though, um, I put in the written stories and I put in the best quotes. So um, I think they could be told through video had I had more time to be able to put those videos together. Um, but I also think they can be told through text. All right, thanks very much. I'm going to go ahead and transfer to uh, Shama, our last presenter. All right, can everyone hear me first of all? Yes, we can. I'm going to share my screen now. Hopefully it works. Wait one second. Okay. All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Shama Stevenson, and my capstone is entitled In Search of Zion. Okay. Um, In Search of Zion is an interactive story for language learners. It allows language learners to, um, of course, learn a language, and it's, it's supposed to be used as supplemental material within the classroom. Um, my intended audience are actually language learners on the intermediate level. There are a lot of games for language learners who, you know, are starting off or, or on the rudimentary level of language learning. So I wanted to create something for the intermediate people. Also, of course, my, um, my project was uh, created in Twine. If you're unfamiliar with Twine, Twine is a software that is created for Nonlinear stories and in search of Zion is a nonlinear story that allows the user to go throughout the story and make different decisions. And based on their decisions, the story may change or you may see something differently compared to a linear story that is just from beginning to end. And within in search of Zion, um, within Twine, um, I use CSS and HTML and JavaScript in order to um, in order to stylize the game. I also use Photoshop for the illustrations that I created myself. Okay, so why this capstone? So the reason why I chose to create an interactive story for language learners is because currently I'm learning language, a language myself, I'm learning Spanish. And um, I began learning Spanish, if I recall, in maybe elementary, and it would start with classes, of course, and I took Spanish up until high school, then eventually I took it in college. But um, there was never a point where I personally believed that I could actually learn the language and become fluent in it. Because I felt that like schools in America, they, they offer classes in foreign language, but they really don't put enough effort into it like other, other countries. So is one of the reasons why I chose this capstone. And for an example, um, Duolingo, in the case of Duolingo, um, Duolingo, excuse me, it's, um, it uses gamification in order to, you know, teach different vocabulary and different um, phrases. So I wanted to um, add gamification to my story element. So as I said before, I use Twine and Twine allows you to basically create a setup of your story. And as I said before, it is a nonlinear story. So 
as as you can see on the screen there are lines going in different directions and what that means is is branching off allowing the user to um allowing the user to make decisions and based on those decisions it may go to another another part of the game so um basically my process was i first started off with my story of course and once i created my story for the game, I brought it into Twine, and this is a preview of what the final story would look like for me. And as you can see, there are a lot of different branching elements for the game. Okay, now as after I created my story, um, I started, and after I actually added it to Twine, I started. Um, doing the illustrations for my story. And one of my main inspirations was manga. But um, at first I had a different art style. What I planned on doing was, you know, creating a painting of the story, a digital painting of it. But um, I ran into a lot of difficulties due to COVID. And, and I also got a lot of feedback from it. But um, so I chose to do a manga style illustrations for my story as you can see on the left that would be what i use and i used that in photoshop um also inspiration was another twine game called my father's long long legs it's an interesting twine game and some of its illustrations are in black and white and they are very similar to the manga illustrations that um, i would eventually inspire be inspired from um, some of the challenges and difficulties. Uh, so one of the main challenges that I came across was actually working in Twine at first because I had no idea about this software, but I would talk, I talked to individuals who told me about what would be the best, the best platform in order to create an interactive story that is nonlinear. And Twine offers that ability quite easily, but also in Twine, there's an option for you to use CSS, HTML, and JavaScript in order to stylize the game as I did before. Another thing is the language bar barrier. While I'm slightly intermediate Spanish, um, I still needed help in order to translating, in order to translate my game from English into Spanish. So one of the main things that I did was I became a part of a Discord channel. And within this Discord channel, I talked with individuals who wanted to learn English and and I wanted to learn Spanish and it's like a language it's like a language exchange exchange discord and basically I was able to talk to individuals who were professors or teachers or even regular Spanish speakers and I would send them my Spanish so that I would translate myself and they would tell me if I had any errors or if there were any ways that I could improve it to sound more natural in their language. Um, also, another thing, another difficulty that I had during this time period was the artwork. Like I said, originally I did want to do digital painting, a digital painting style. And I did at some point do that for about two of my illustrations, but it was so time consuming and I knew that I did not have enough time, especially in this day and age where there's COVID and I'm usually on a computer inside of a lab that is a lot better than what I have on my laptop, which runs uh, quite slower than the lab computers. Okay, and I'm gonna go to the game real quick in order to show you a few things about it. Okay, I think this is it. Let me know if you can hear the sound. Anyway, so the game starts with an illustration that I created myself. Um, I would like to note that this game is entirely in Spanish for the intermediate language learners who are able to communicate um, effectively, but they still um, have trouble with vocabulary or they're trying to learn different phrases. Okay, so this is the start of the game and some of the features that include in the game that are included in the game would be the word bank as this is all in Spanish. I'm in an effort to um, create a word bank where the person would be able to click on this word and they'll be able to go through the words that are uh, uncommon to the intermediate level. 
speakers so they would be able to get a preview of some words that they would not necessarily know. And also within this game, um, you are able to go through it, of course. I'm going to go through the game a little bit. Different sections of the game. I'm going to turn up the sound a bit. As I said before, um, you have within this game, you can make different decisions. You can respond to the, the sentence differently. And based on that response, you will get a different scenario. Also to note within this game period is if, since it's a branching game, this is a branching game, your decisions may um, actually withhold information. For an example, I'll just go to this part of the game. So as I said before, your decisions um, will um, directly affect the way the game shows. So if you were to go back real quick, I'm sorry, guys, I'm kind of nervous right now. But um, so this is, go back to this, I'm sorry, guys. Okay, within this section, let's just assume that these are four different scenarios for you. So if you click on this section right here, you get one, um, one um, decision. But if you go throughout this game, sorry, right, yeah, let me go back. Trust. Okay, but if you follow a different scenario, and you go back to the previous scenario, you're given another option. So um, basically, the user is going throughout the game as a certain character, and as this character learns more information, you also get different decisions that you can use. To all right, I'm going to end it right there. Um, if you want to play this game, um, you're able to find this game on itch.io, where you'll be able to download it, and you would just click on the HTML file, and you can play it on your Mac or PC. And that is the end of my presentation. Okay, well, we got a couple of questions specifically for Shama and then a couple of questions for all of you. <laughs> so uh, specifically for Shama, um, in what ways are intermediate learners different from beginner learners? Okay, for beginner learners, um, beginner learners are learners who um, are not familiar with conjugating, they're not familiar with certain words, but um, for intermediate levels, they have a good understanding of how to conjugate words in like past tense or present tense. And within this game, you would have to have that understanding of it in order to play it. Okay. Um, do you think that the project would have been different if you had written it in Spanish first instead of writing in English and translating? Um, well, yes, because I'm not a Spanish speaker, so I wouldn't be able to um, necessarily translate it to English properly. Um, I guess you could say it would be different, but that would have to be from someone who um, original language is Spanish compared to, uh, you know, me who who um, original language is English. So, yeah. Okay, and so can you tell us about the title for your project? What does it mean? Um, it's kind of a spoiler if you want to know, <laughs> but um, the title is directly associated with the ending of the game. And um, um, let's see, I can probably give you an overview of what the story is about. So the story is about a, I'll tell you what the original story was about. But um, the story was about a college student who went back home to babysit for his brother because his mother, she was having a type of episode, she was having uh some kind of she has uh how do i explain this 
It's sort of like a mental illness, but she's a bit paranoid. So you went back home to babysit for your brother. And a lot of situations happened where you start to unravel a lot of scenarios and things of why your mother is like this. And eventually in search of Zion is it goes back to uh, someone finding this person named Zion. I'm not going to tell you if that's the main character or if that's someone within the story, but um, In Search of Zion has to do with finding that person. Yeah. So we've got kind of two and a half questions for everyone. So the first one is, um, this was the uh, COVID-19 semester of IA Media. Um, and many of you talked about how it presented some limitations to the kind of uh, project that you were able to do for your capstone. Was there anything that was helpful because of the uh, COVID experience? I mean, uh, sorry, Anna, where are you going to go? You go ahead. <laughs> um, I know for me personally, I'm a very time management organized Person. So having like being home and around where I like all the activities I wanted to do are allowed me to have more time, honestly, to kind of plan what I wanted to do. And I could hide, kind of hold myself away at home. But also, if I needed that um, kind of a stress break, I was around my dogs, which for me was a really big deal. Um, I know that's probably not the answer that you're looking for, um, but being home really helped me with that because it was a good stress relief. Um, for me, so I got the plan and I got my stress relief for my dogs. So, um, I was going to say that I talked about how I had to use C sharp, which was a brand new language that I've never coded with before. And there were times that I just couldn't figure something out and I kind of lost confidence in myself. And then I'd email our prof a professor or I was planning to meet with a professor the next day and I figured it out that night by myself and it was like a huge confidence boost to say okay I figured this out by myself and I just a minute ago I was like ready to put this capstone down and put it to rest because I didn't think I could do it um it's always good to go to your professors and ask for help when you need it but it also feels really good to be able to figure something out by yourself okay will I saw your hand up It may get out of my comfort zone. And like Anna said, I'm trying to figure out how to do things by yourself without necessarily having relying on asking somebody for help. And then for me also, I think it helped expand my project from what it was to what it ended up becoming. Um, just cause it sort of made me, sort of made me get more creative on how I was gonna solve certain problems. Um, sort of made me expand um, my ideas of who my audience was going to be and who like I needed to design this for. And it just made me, um, I think it just helped my creative skills in general. And um, it gave me a lot of lessons in working through adversity. Cool, okay. And Tirza, sorry to cut you off before. No, it's okay. Um, I think that I totally agree with every, with with everyone has said um it definitely made us like self-starters it made us think harder about how we're going to like present our topics i feel like a lot of us didn't really change from when we started um planning out our capstone so i think that this coronavirus experience has definitely allowed us to like expand our knowledge and just like trust in ourselves more than we ever had before on like just finding out information and solving problems Yeah, uh, that'll be a great answer. You'll be able to give in a job interview really soon, I think, because everybody's going to ask you about that for sure. And, um, you know, it's a great chance for you guys to show how resilient you were in the face of what was obviously a really big challenge for a lot of you, because like the content you thought you were going to be able to get just kind of wasn't there anymore. But you guys came up with some really creative solutions to deal with that. Uh, the other question I had that goes for everybody is how are you going to apply um, what you've done for your capstone, what you've done in the iMedia program in your desired field of work. I'll go. Um, <laughs> so I think, like, just from the last question, this 
gave me tunnel vision and definitely showed me how to improvise. So not necessarily the skills that it took for me to create it. I think like just what this entire experience has taught me just showing that I can work outside of my comfort zone. Like Tirza said, I can be a self-starter and you know, even when things seem uncertain, you know, I feel like I can get the job done. And I feel like that's a good quality to, you know, me being a candidate looking for a job, I feel like that's a good quality to possess. Um, for me, I know when I started the program, I didn't have any of the skills I have now because I was coming from a science background where I haven't taken an art class since middle school. Um, so now it's kind of the, all the ideas I had and like the ways I wanted to teach people and explain things. I have all these new skills like with graphics and video and all of like website design. I can kind of show it in any, any form I put my mind to now. And I know how to learn how to do it if I don't know it from this program itself. So. Um, for me, it was a lot of what um a lot of what's already been said. It really forced me. I learned that I can work outside my comfort zone. I learned that I can teach myself new skills and new technologies. And I didn't really have much of a technical background going into this program. So a lot of what I learned this year it was my first time ever doing it. But I really just sort of learned how to take um like my my primary skills, what I what my primary strengths were and expand upon those and really um make myself useful, make myself versatile in a lot of different areas. And I think that um that that um element of having a primary skill base, but being able to do a lot of different things and solve a lot of different problems will um, serve me well going forward. Um I oh go ahead. <laughs> um I think that this uh, experience has shown me that I love sustainability more than I thought and love the environment more than I thought. So, because um, my original project had nothing to do with this. So I think that this was a great experience for me. And now that I have like this hot keyword in my project for sustainability, I've been searching for more jobs with environmentally friendly uh, aspects to their uh, work life. And I think that that's really this project is really going to help me break into that side of the work field for graphic design. So. Yeah, and um, as they said before, even though we had a kind of limited, maybe limited experience in some aspect of this program, we were able to branch out and look at different sides of interactive media from coding to web design. And I think that since we have a feel of what those categories can give us, then we can kind of we can kind of work with individuals who also are in that same vein of interactive media or in same vein of you know their working experience. Um, based off what everyone else has said, um, the same for me. I learned definitely about developing for different mediums. Um, you know, I had some experience in web design or web development before this, but um, being able to take those same skills and teach myself a new coding language or code on a different medium entirely, I think really strengthened those skills as well, but also strengthened my web development skills. So. Well, fantastic. We are just about at the end of our time. Um, this was a new way of doing the capstone presentations, and I agree with someone who just commented. I'm glad you were able to rise to the challenges that coronavirus presented. Um, every capstone exhibition usually has a theme to it, and I think you guys is probably could have changed to resilience because you had a whole lot on your plate trying to do like a quarter of this program basically on your own. Um, and on behalf of all of the faculty and the staff, we're really proud of you guys. And we'll see you tomorrow at graduation. So, yay. All right. Congratulations, everybody. Yay. <laughs> Everyone. <laughs> Thank you. So, we're just leaving. <laughs>